Thank you very much to California State University, Monterey Bay, for the honor of being here to speak to you all tonight as we kick off your fall semester. So I'm a speaker, an author, as Michelle said, and a skyscraper tour guide. And my specialty is especially antique skyscrapers and the tycoons who built them and their stories. Western skyscrapers of the Gilded Age is our subject for the next uh, two weeks. Before I get started, I should confess that I'm from the East. Pittsburgh technically counts as a East Coast, also could kind of count as Midwest. At any rate, so I've got a foot in the Midwest with Chicago and with the, the East with New York, but I do also understand California has a lot of expertise with tall things. And as Michelle mentioned, I was just recently back in California. I've been there many times. Uh, earlier this month, we had a family vacation, my daughter, just graduated from Loyola Marymount. My daughter Cricket also designed the cover of Multistory. So uh, we went out to watch that graduation down in LA. And then uh, you can see we went up to Yosemite. There's El Capitan. We unfortunately didn't have time to climb it, uh, but we did get a chance to go up and, uh, and, and look at Glacier Point and also see the, uh, the, the, the speaking of tall things, these beautiful uh, coastal redwoods and Muir Woods. And that's Cricket, my, my uh, cover designer having her photo taken in a, in a redwood by my wife. And I have to say, in Muir Woods, I've never felt quite so seen uh, as I did reading this sign. So if you take a look at it, uh, the comparative graphic here shows that a dad <laughs> is the certain height compared to a killer whale, giraffe, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and so on. And of course, the ferry building. Uh, a tall building in San Francisco and, and a redwood tree. I'm actually six feet tall, so we'll need to fix this sign. But in the spirit of the sign, my goal is to keep this talk light and fun. And that's my approach really in the book, Multi-Stories too. So let me tell you real quick why I wrote it. Here in Pittsburgh, we have some really amazing old time skyscrapers from the era when they first were built, right around 1900 even before. And that's when Pittsburgh steel industry was really booming. So there was a whole lot of wealth being generated here. And uh, so consequently, there was a lot of money to build skyscrapers. But I noticed nearly everything you read about skyscrapers and their early development comes from New York and Chicago. It barely mentions cities like Pittsburgh. And, and that makes sense because New York and Chicago are the birthplace of skyscrapers. But there are cities with lots of interesting skyscrapers, including out there where you guys are. Los Angeles and San Francisco skylines are both known for their skyscrapers. And if I ask you to picture a skyscraper in your mind, this is probably the sort of building that you think of. And not so much the first skyscrapers, which are also in this image, but hard to spot because they're dwarfed by the more modern construction and they're not anywhere near as tall, so they get lost in the shadows. But the point is, if you, were, if you rewind the clock a century back and more, when those first skyscrapers in the world were brand new, they were also seen as a marvel of technology. And furthermore, these skyscrapers radically changed every single city in America not just New York and Chicago, but Pittsburgh, San Francisco, Los Angeles. And so let's take a look back at those antique skyscrapers and find out how they got their start. And to do that, we do have to start in New York City. This is a view of skyscrapers from the Hudson River in 1912. And this view shows the world's tallest skyscraper, the Woolworth Building, which was just then finishing up construction and was preparing to open in 1913, the following year. Now, for a comparison, it, it isn't the tallest building in the world at that time. It's the second tallest building. The tallest building then was the Eiffel Tower, which for comparison purposes would basically reach the top of the screen there. But it was the tallest building with walls. It was the tallest building meant to be inhabited. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about a skyscraper, an office building or residential building or some kind of building that is meant for constant uh, habitation of some kind, constant use. And what you see when you look at this picture is maybe quaint 
and seems like a sweet antique, but actually, I'd like to argue that it is a representation of high technology moving at blistering speed. And that is because you can see in this image, not only the tallest skyscraper of 1912, 1913, the Woolworth building, but to its right, the second tallest building, the Singer building, which sadly no longer is standing, but this was the world's tallest skyscraper in 1908. And if you look in between the two, there's a little spot where there are two little cupolas pointing up, two twin towers, if you will, which are the tallest building in the world in 1899. So over the course of just over a decade, you can see the pace of construction. Behind the Woolworth building, you can't see it because it's blocking them, is the tallest skyscraper in New York in 1890. Um, and if you happen to ride a boat down the Hudson River today, you wouldn't be able to see any of these buildings because taller skyscrapers are blocking them. So that may seem like these, as I say, are kind of quaint and old fashioned, but the thing is, if the person who took this picture had a time machine and could go back 40 years to 1872, absolutely nothing you see in this photograph would be there. The tallest thing that you would see in the skyline then would be the steeple of Trinity Church which is probably about as tall as some of these buildings here on the right-hand side. Not quite as tall, but almost as tall. It's a tall steeple. So 40 years ago, all of these skyscrapers did not exist yet. Think about what your city would look like if you went back 40 years. Would it have changed as much as this? I can still remember 1981, 40 years ago. That's when MTV launched. You know, we talk a lot about the internet and technology, but I can say that in 1981, we were already kind of bored that astronauts had landed on the moon. And yet, if I walk around downtown Pittsburgh today, it doesn't look that substantially different. The tallest building 40 years ago there is still the tallest building uh, now in my city. That's not the case in some cities in California, but still you can recognize the skyline from 40 years ago. Think about this, the people that lived in that era not only lived through the invention of telephones, automobiles, airplanes, all in this 40 year span I'm talking about, but also these skyscrapers that changed their cities and cities all around the country. So we think about these folks with their straw hats or their dresses with bustles and their funny looking bicycles with big wheels on them, but they really endured a lot of stupendous changes and they could probably tell us something about what it's like to experience technology. And guess what? I have a time machine, so let's get in and go back 40 years to Manhattan. In 1872, if you wanted a bird's eye view of Manhattan, you would climb up, as I said, the steeple of Trinity Church on Broadway. And this is an illustration from 1872. And it is looking up uh, Broadway. So from that era, you can see no skyscrapers, just church steeples, really. And uh, on the right, another illustration, uh, I think that's from Harper's Weekly of Broadway, you can see that uniformly the buildings are about five stories tall. And that's because that was about as high as anyone wanted to climb a staircase. Now, an inventor named Elisha Otis had already demonstrated the safety elevator in New York in the 1850s, 1853 in the uh, World's Fair in New York City. But still, um, uh, uh, elevators were still seen as a, a luxury, and you really only encountered them for the most part in hotels and upscale department stores until everything changed. In 1875, the world's first 10 story office building opened on Broadway, and there it is, you can see it under construction. It's for Western Union, the telegraph company, and it does look a little bit like a church or a, a city hall from Europe or something, but this is the corporate headquarters of the world's biggest telecommunications company. So at the time, it represents uh, a huge technological advance. This is a company that is laying, remember, telegraph cables across the floor of the ocean to reach Europe so we can have near instantaneous news and communication between the continents across the ocean. And another high-tech innovation that it, it, it pioneered to sort of show off its prowess 
was atop that spire, you can see a hole through it where a clock face is going to go. And on top of that is a formed to be a spire. And on that spire was a big painted wooden ball. And every day, precisely at noon, on a telegraph signal from the National Observatory in Washington, uh, that ball would drop down the spire and come to rest on top of the, uh, of the tower there. And that is how folks in New York City would set their pocket watches to get the precise time of noon. If you go down Broadway today, you won't see this building anymore. It was torn down long ago, but that tradition remains. I'm sure you're all familiar with the ball dropping in Times Square to signal the start of a new year. This is where it came from. New York is not the only city that has interesting skyscrapers in that era. Of course, Chicago, I mentioned, is the other seen by many as the birthplace of skyscrapers. That's a contentious point, depends on who you ask and depends on what you count as a skyscraper. But this is an article in the Chicago Tribune in 1891, and it gives you some of that famous windy city spirit. I'll read it out to you. It says, Chicago's big buildings, one of the many things at which we beat the world. The verdict of the New York press, never considered to be over-enthusiastic in commendation of Chicago, is that to Chicago more than any other city is due the development of the revolution in modern buildings. And you see some of their big buildings there. Chicago is the first place that the word skyscraper was widely used to describe a building, which at the time it generally applied to buildings of 10 or more stories. On the right is my own photograph from a recent visit to, of the Monadnock building. Uh, it opened the year that article came out in 1891. Um, you'll see it on the lower left in the newspaper article. It is still today the world's tallest brick skyscraper, 18 stories tall. Um, it was designed by Daniel Burnham and John Root, two very well-known and popular and, and famous uh, uh, Chicago early skyscraper architects. Uh, and, and Burnham went on to great fame and fortune. Root sadly didn't live long enough to do so. But um, this building, as I said, was made of bricks. And the trick with brick skyscrapers is that, or, or any building made of brick or stone or earth, is that when the walls have to bear the load of the building, as this does, or a castle or a cathedral, then the walls have to be thick enough to support that weight. And if you look at the sidewalk level of the Monadnock building in my photograph, you can see how it flares out. The walls are six feet thick right there at the ground in order to hold up all that weight. The problem is the sidewalk level is the most profitable level of a skyscraper if you're leasing space in it. That's where all of the stores will go. And so if you have less room for shop windows and doors and office space, then you are reducing the amount of rent you can charge. And after all, a skyscraper is not some kind of dreamy construction by someone right out of architecture school. A skyscraper must be paid for and therefore must be commissioned. And a, a, a prominent architect in New York of skyscrapers at the turn of the century, Cass Gilbert, who designed the Woolworth building we looked at earlier, the tallest skyscraper in the early skyscraper world. Cass Gilbert said, a skyscraper is a machine that makes the land pay. In other words, if you own a lot in a city where uh, space is in demand, you try to multiply that lot as many times as you can, because each time you multiply it with another floor, you are adding another space that you can lease. And most skyscrapers, both back then and today, are designed mainly for rental income, lease income, and only small segments of their floor area are given over to the company that often bears the name of the skyscraper. Monadnock was just the name of a mountain in New Hampshire. It's Boston investors wanted to use that. They thought it sounded nice. But even when you have buildings that are named after a corporation, you'll find most of the floors in that building aren't owned or used by that corporation. They're used for income. So steel framing changed skyscrapers. And uh, a lot of that came about in the 1890s. And a lot of that steel came from Pittsburgh here. This is an 1893 illustration showing the heights of the tallest things in America at the time. 
So that's the tallest building temporarily was the Masonic Temple, which was another Daniel Burnham and John Root building in Chicago, the same guys who did the Monadnock. And Daniel, uh, I'm sorry, and then there's Trinity Church from Broadway, uh, where we saw earlier the sightseeing view, the Statue of Liberty, uh, of course, the Capitol Dome, and my own Pittsburgh, my hometown contribution there. This was a brand new invention that debuted that year in Chicago in 1893, invented by a Pittsburgh bridge engineer named William Ferris. That's the first Ferris wheel, and it was enormous. Each of the cars was the size of a rail car. Why did they build a gigantic Ferris wheel? Well, the idea was to outdo the previous World's Fair, which was in Paris in 1889, where the Eiffel Tower was unveiled. The Chicago World's Fair was immense, and it's kind of difficult to put into words. Uh, it outdoes Disney World, Disneyland. Uh, it attracted in huge crowds, um, tens of millions of Americans in the middle of depression took trains out to Chicago to experience this. And the man who was in charge of designing the entire fair and hiring all the architects was Daniel Burnham, who later went on to do the Flatiron Building in New York and many skyscrapers across the country, including in my hometown, including out on the West Coast too. Um, the main exhibit hall, which you see there, the Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building, was the biggest building on earth. And uh, if you look at it, it's the size of basically two football stadiums. It was designed by George Post, who was the architect of the Western Union Building on Broadway we saw earlier. He was a major early skyscraper architect in New York City. Post also designed, what you see on the left here, the world's first 20-story office building. Um, this is the headquarters of the New York world uh, at what they called Newspaper Row, right across from City Hall. All these buildings are hidden in the original uh, illustration I showed you um, from the Hudson uh, by a taller building, the Woolworth, which sort of faces them across the park in front of City Hall. Um, but Newspaper Row sort of symbolizes how newspapers were extremely profitable at one time. I used to write for a newspaper here in Pittsburgh, so uh, I, I long for the days when newspapers were immensely profitable, may they return. But Joseph Pulitzer, his New York World building is there on the left. Uh, the newspaper, by the way, is in the, in the dome and the, the, the top, the projecting part. Uh, all the other floors in the fatter part of the building are, are for rent. Next to it is Horace Greeley's Tribune. It's building with, the, uh, with a pointy sort of belfry and then next to that, the gray building in the foreground is the New York Times's first tall office tower before it pulled up stakes and moved to Times Square and built a new one. And both of those buildings to the right of the, of the world building are actually extended. They started shorter than that. And then they felt so outclassed by Pulitzer's world building uh, that they stretched a couple more stories. And this is the last slide I show you of New York because I wanted to show you that across the continent out there in California where you all are, there was another newspaper row in San Francisco. This is at the intersection of Market and Kearney Streets. So let me tell you about the San Francisco newspaper row and the participants a little bit. The Chronicle was the first oldest paper. This was started by a pair of brothers uh, Harry D. Young and his little brother, Charles D. Young, in 1865. And they're fascinating. They were very hot-headed, these guys. Newspaper publishers back in the day uh, were even more incendiary <laughs> than they became in later years. Uh, I should say Charles, the editor, the younger brother of the two, uh, insulted a local judge in the paper. And in 1874, he fought a pistol duel with him. Um, also, uh, Harry, uh, well, I'm sorry, five years later, uh, the same guy, Charles D. Young, got into an argument with a man who was running for mayor. And when the candidate retaliated by accusing Charles's mother of running a brothel, Charles shot him. <laughs> that was uh, Isaac Callock, the candidate. And uh, Mr. Callock survived the shooting he won the race, he became mayor of San Francisco and his son got revenge. He shot Charles de Young and, and killed him. So uh, four years later, after Harry had taken over as editor, uh, the Chronicle insulted the Spreckles family which made its money um, refining sugar they brought in from Hawaii. 
and one of the Spreckles family burst into the newsroom of the Chronicle and, and shot uh, Harry de Young, the editor who survived. And uh, I guess at that point, he decided if I'm gonna go through all this getting shot in the newsroom, I'm going to build a classy newsroom. So he brought Daniel Burnham and John Root to, uh, or to San Francisco from Chicago to design the Chronicle building, which was the first skyscraper in San Francisco. You can see it there on the left. Now, after he had done that, the Spreckles decided they needed to compete against the DeYoung. So they bought another newspaper in San Francisco called The Call, and they put up this building you see on the right, a marble palace, 15 stories tall, so much taller than the Chronicle building, just across the intersection from the Chronicle building to sort of rub their nose in it. The headline you can see says, nearly double the height of any building on the Pacific coast. So knowing that, I'd like to tell you about another angry young San Francisco newspaper publisher, this guy. His name is of course, William Randolph Hearst. And you can see, <laughs> he seems petulant. He is the son of a rich California miner from Missouri uh, named George Hearst. And George had come out to California, struck it rich as a prospector. And so he had political aspirations and he bought another newspaper called the San Francisco Examiner and used it to sort of bolster his profile until he was, uh, until he became a US Senator. And so he took his son, who was a Harvard dropout, kind of spoiled, uh, only child, he put his son in charge of his paper, the Examiner, and that's 1887. And once that Chronicle building went up in 1889, William wanted his own newspaper skyscraper. So he wrote to his father in Washington, quote, how long do you suppose it will be before we can put up a building, a stunner that will knock his end ways and make him as sick as he is now making me? So dad said, go ahead. And William bought some land also right there at the intersection of uh, Kearney and Market and announced plans in his paper that they were going to build an even bigger skyscraper. But then George Hearst unexpectedly died and William was not in charge of the family fortune. That would be his mom, Phoebe Apperson Hearst. She was a former school teacher from Missouri and also a trustee at Cal Berkeley, very very influential. Um, and so she was tight with the purse strings. William had to settle for this seven story skyscraper. It's quite lovely. I believe uh, Phoebe Hearst had rooms in the uh, top floor. So this is the West Coast's newspaper row in uh, 1902. You can see the Chronicle on the left, the Hearst building in the middle and the Call building on the right, Market and Third. And this is where all, all the, the Hearst the Chronicle and the Call Building all stand to this day. Well, kind of, because in 1906, of course, there was the great earthquake. And one thing uh, that I came to understand about the great earthquake is that it also led to the great fire. So the pipes all ruptured, and that means the, national, the natural gas supply lines going into the buildings, supplying them with light and heat, Suddenly, we're releasing natural gas into those buildings, and the fire hydrants, too, no longer had a water supply, so the city burned to the ground. I guess one of the things, if you're looking on the bright side, is that for a day, all three of those warring newspapers published their own joint edition using, the, uh, using a press in Oakland that was across the bay, so they were, uh, they were just for a day friends again, earthquake and fire, San Francisco and ruins. There you can see uh, that the Hearst building, that's the ruins of the Hearst building after the earthquake and fire. So actually William Randolph Hearst was in New York at the time, starting a new newspaper war with Joseph Pulitzer in his world building. So he wasn't in town for the earthquake, but he saw an opportunity. He announced now that uh, the Hearst building burned down, we're going to build a giant new Hearst building right there in the spot where it stood. Um, the Chronicle building and the Call building, by the way, were both hollowed out by the fire, but 
still stand in that location, though heavily changed and almost unrecognizable from the photos that we saw earlier. Uh, the Hearst building was basically in ruins. So here's the announcement. They would build the tallest building in the West, fireproof and earthquake proof, and perhaps the most attractive in its commanding beauty, the story goes on to say. It's in the California mission style of architecture. And so Hearst went ahead and announced this to the public and you all can see what's coming, don't you? He forgot to ask his mom. So I call this slide, my fall plans versus the Delta variant. Or if you're not up on memes, it's Phoebe Hearst strikes again. The building on the right is what really got built and the one you can still visit to this day. Um, when it was built, Hearst had to sort of back down of his original claims. And in the stories announcing its construction, he said that the frame was sturdy enough to add another 10 stories on top at any time in the future. As soon as they decided that that was fiscally prudent, uh, they were never built. It still looks about the same as it looks there. It's still owned by the Hearst Corporation, though they no longer own the examiner. Uh, there's some talk about making it into a hotel. COVID has thrown everything into disarray, so we shall see. Uh, and, and though it is shorter than that grandiose original plan, uh, don't get the idea that this building is garbage. The lobby is absolutely tremendous. Uh, it's carved stone, gold leaf. It, over each of those four elevator bays is a great seal of the state of California, then the state of Oregon, the state of Washington, and the territory of Alaska from the time. Um, also, Another fun thing I learned about the Examiner is that it was very well known for its sports coverage. So this is from uh, 1910, and this is the era before radio. So one of the things that, uh, that, that they would do at the Hearst Building and other newspapers is in the big windows above the, above the first story, they would paint the headlines on big sheets of paper or newsprint and hang them up so that as you're used to walking by ticker, we're well not ticker tape, but electronic scrolling signs. Before there were electronic scrolling signs, they'd hold up the, 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 the news bulletin or the news headlines. But also what they did was sports coverage. So for live sports coverage, this uh, slide shows how they handled that. What they had was, this is no radio, but there was a person on the telephone in Reno, Nevada, where the boxing match was happening who was calling another person there at the examiner's offices on Market Street. And the man on the other line of the phone on Market Street was standing up on a temporary stage uh, uh, high above the street there, Market Street, next to two boxers who had a referee standing in between them too. And they, were, they would act out as the man on the telephone called in or repeated what he was hearing about what's happening in the real boxing match in Reno. These two actor boxers would reenact the fight as it was happening. And you can see that this, though this seems extraordinarily dinky to you and me and anyone else we know, it sure drew a crowd in 1910 before there was such a thing as radio or television. So that's how you watched a boxing match in another city in 1910. I just find that fascinating. You could see they got throngs of people. Here's another great skyscraper story from San Francisco. On Market Street, just some blocks down is the Flood Building, which is named for James Flood, who was a mining tycoon from something they called the Bonanza Strike, uh, a silver strike near the Comstock or in the Comstock Road in, in Nevada. This building was actually built by uh, James Flood's son, also James, uh, in his honor. And you can see that the initial coverage of it says that this new 12-story building will rise Phoenix-like from the site of a hotel that had burned down in 1902. Uh-oh, <laughs> it's a little premonition of what fate has in store for the brand new Flood building that has just risen Phoenix-like from the site of a fire. But before we get to that, and you all know where that's headed. I wanna tell you a little about James Flood's story, which is terrific and frankly is my very favorite story of anyone who ever built a skyscraper. Now, James Flood was an immigrant from Ireland. You see him there on the left. Um, he grew up in poverty in New York, uh, working class. Um, he was a wheel maker. When he heard about the gold rush out in, in, in the mountains in the Sierras, he jumped aboard a ship, dropped everything, came out, and actually, unlike most people who tried this, 
he succeeded. He struck gold, found gold, and, and struck it comparatively rich for someone who was a working class wheel maker from New York. And so he hauled up all his gold, headed back east, married a nice Irish girl, and started a farm. Um, and then decided farming was boring and he missed California. So sold the farm, took his new wife, went back to San Francisco and used his money to buy a bar. And the bar was near a stock market. And he and his partner, another Irish immigrant, um, they'd use that, they, they had that bar that was uh, a welcome gathering place for stockbrokers in San Francisco from all of the new mining developments. And so they'd get tips from them. And they got enough tips actually that they finally opened their own brokerage house. And then they went in with two other Irish miners and started investing in low producing mines in Nevada. And they eventually found a huge bonanza, as I said, in the Comstock load. And suddenly this man in middle age with a family is worth something on the order in the 1870s of 25 to $30 million. So these were the Bonanza Kings, they were called. And so successful were they that a reporter from the New York Tribune came out to Virginia City, Nevada to see the operations of this Bonanza mine. And one of his first questions as he went underground and looked at all these you know, miners chipping uh, and, and mining silver out of, the, out of the mine was, where do you guys get all of this timber to support the roof? We're in Nevada. It's... It's scrubland and desert. There aren't any big trees. Where does the lumber come from? So James Flood said, come on with me. They jumped on some horses. He and a partner of his, one of the other Bonanza Kings, uh, James Fair, took this reporter from New York on horseback. They went up into the Sierra Nevadas up near Lake Tahoe where they had a sawmill. And that's where the logs were from. And they would go down the log flume to a rail yard uh, right there at the foot of the mountains. And suddenly James Flood got this idea that makes him legendary to me because right then this multi multi-millionaire set for life, it's all of his life out in front of him decides, I'm gonna dare this reporter to jump in the log flume with me. And right there and then he and James Fair invented the log flume ride. And this coverage, once the reporter made it back to New York and put this in the New York papers is one of my favorites. Hang on to your hats, they yell. And the, keep in mind this log flume, it, it takes them a half hour to get to the end of it. It's points they are a hundred feet above the valley floor and on this timber structure. There are parts of this log flume that are 45 degree angles. So it is not built for a gentle amusement park ride. This is built simply to bring logs and planks down to the hill as fast and as efficiently as possible. And I love this quote, which uh, you can't really do better than this for 1870s newspaper quote. I'll have to look at it on my screen over here. The reporter says, we made the entire distance in less time than a railroad train would ordinarily make. And a portion of the distance we went faster than a railroad train ever went. Fair said we went at least a mile a minute. Flood said we went at the rate of 100 miles an hour. And my deliberate belief is that we went at a rate that annihilated time and space. Well, of course, the fire burned down the flood building, but it was renovated. You can see it now if you go to San Francisco at the top of the BART station at Powell and Market Street, right there at the cable car turnaround. And uh, inside, you can see in the lobby, they've got a wonderful exhibit, and including a charred beam from the fire in 1906. And it's one of the very few buildings that I've written about that stayed in the family for its entire history. That's Karen Flood, the great, great granddaughter of James Flood. And she's the executive director of the Union Square Business Improvement District. And the Chicago World's Fair sort of solidified in the minds of the country that the style of grand buildings should be the style that was sort of accepted by professional architects who had been trained in the School of Fine Arts in Paris, which the most aspirational architects were. So that was uh, the School of Fine Arts in French is Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And so that term Beaux-Arts, uh, B-E-A-U-X-A-R-T-S, Beaux-Arts, 
but Beaux-Arts is the style that you see. It's kind of a marriage of classical Greek and Roman with Renaissance styling. And that is the style that everyone in the 1890s decided buildings ought to look like. Anything big and grand and inspirational, it actually spurred something called the City Beautiful Movement, where the aim was to make cities look so beautiful with grand spaces and grand structures that newly arriving immigrants and working class folks would be dissuaded from being anarchists and assassins and instead feel that they were part of a grand experiment, a grand social you know, progress. And so many of these buildings, as you can see here, well, I was just about to say, Karen Flood on the left is the great, great granddaughter of James Flood. And her dad, who sadly passed away last year, uh, was responsible for fixing up the facade of the Flood building. So the building in the center is my own photograph from a recent visit. Um, and if you look at it, you know, it, it, it's quite grand and it has those sort of motifs that look very classical. Um, but on the right is one of the worst um, modernization jobs I have seen in my, in my travels, in my research. And this is when Woolworth uh, had the department store in the 1950s on the bottom floors of the flood building. And they tore out all of these entrances and replaced them with whatever Jetsons inspired uh, frontage that is. And so for many years, the, the, the entrances of the flood building were quite damaged. And so uh, the family has fixed them. And congratulations to the floods. I spoke with uh, Karen Flood recently, and she is quite a wonderful person. So I'm uh, looking forward to getting a chance to meet next time I'm out there in the Bay. Also, 1903, um, the VIPs in town laid the cornerstone for the new Merchants Exchange building in San Francisco. That's uh, a trading hall for supplies that come into the harbor, um, like a chamber of commerce, basically, a forerunner to that. If you look on the top of the building, it has an observation tower. So you can see ships as they're coming in through the Golden Gate because the ships have flags on them. And, uh, and, and you can tell, your messengers can run down and tell the folks on the trading floor uh, what ship's coming with what load in its hold, and they could start selling even before the ships hit the docks. It was so big that, in fact, the, the newspaper report at the time says it looked like an ocean liner was sailing up the street, and it opened in 1905. If you look here in the aftermath of the earthquake, something that I was surprised to learn, the skyscrapers didn't fall down. The tall buildings didn't all fall down. Anything with a steel framework, which is what uh, innovation skyscrapers uh, were pioneered in Chicago, instead of bricks holding up the building, a steel framework holds up the building and then the walls don't have to be anywhere near as thick. Um, so the, steels, the steel skyscrapers remain standing for the most part, but they were burned out in that fire. But they were still damaged structurally. This is the uh, granite column in front of the Merchants Exchange and you can see that it's cracked pretty severely. So in the aftermath of that great earthquake, uh, people noticed that of all the buildings in the entire Bay Area of any significant size, there was only one that suffered no damage at all. And it was a new bell tower built of reinforced concrete at Mills College in Oakland. And it was designed by Chicago's first ever practicing female architect. And this is Julia Morgan. She had actually studied at, as the one I mentioned, the, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And Pretty soon she had a line of commissions of people saying, come out and help fix our buildings so there'd be earthquake proof. And she came on out to that merchant's exchange and redesigned the interior and redesigned the structural supports as well. So she was, a, she was masterful at both of these. Um, that's the banking hall, the trading center, which is now a, a bank. And she hired the muralist also who, who she chose him and, and he did these, uh, Harbor murals. Uh, the ballroom is now called the Julia Morgan Ballroom. She redesigned that as well. It's named in her honor. By the way, about Julia Morgan, she was very private, never gave an interview. And uh, at the same time is now pretty widely agreed to have been a lesbian. So she is highly revered by the LGBT community as a pioneer 
uh, in the profession of architecture and in the business world. And of course, she was a pioneering woman in a profession dominated by men. She had another major female client at the time, by the way, who was a very powerful woman. Uh, she controlled a major mining fortune. She was a trustee of Cal Berkeley, and she had Morgan do some buildings for her, including one in honor of her husband, a very a classical Greek-styled uh, school of mining named after George Hurst, as well as her mansion. This is, of course, we met her earlier, Phoebe Hurst. And when Phoebe Hurst passed away during the influenza epidemic in 1919, Julia Morgan got to be William Randolph Hearst's architect. So now mom is not controlling the purse strings anymore. One of the first projects that Hearst had Morgan do was, uh, was a, a gymnasium with a swimming pool uh, named after his mom, in honor of his mom, Phoebe Hearst. Um, it turns out Julia Morgan was really good at swimming pools. Um, she had done several YWCA buildings for Phoebe Hurst. And so uh, once she made the swimming pool at Cal uh, in honor of Phoebe Hurst, William Randolph Hurst had a new pool job for her. And this is called Hurst Castle in San Simeon. If you look it up, uh, Hearst Castle online, almost always the first photo you see is that pool. By the way, Hearst commuted to his castle from Los Angeles on a private uh, railroad car most of the time. He was in LA building another media empire. And that brings us to Los Angeles. It, I think most of you have seen this photograph. It's most one of the, uh, one of the most famous movie stills from the silent film era. And a lot of people mistakenly think it's Charlie Chaplin, but actually this is another 1920s comedy star, Harold Lloyd. This is from the film Safety Last, which was a major comedy blockbuster hit of the 1920s. And I wanna tell you a few things to keep in mind. Number one, uh, Harold Lloyd is really up that high. That is a skyscraper in downtown Los Angeles in 1925. And if he slips, he is going to fall. Now he won't fall all the way to the street, but he's gonna fall two or three stories where just out of frame, they've got a platform with cushions and he better not bounce because if he bounces off of that, good luck. The other thing is that Harold Lloyd has no thumb on his right hand clinging onto that clock hand. See, as I said, Harold Lloyd did all his stunts and one of those stunts in an earlier movie was holding onto a bomb, a prop bomb that went off and blew his thumb off. So he's not even able to really hold on. If you look kind of closely at that shot, you can tell that his right thumb is fake. So with that in mind, I'd love to watch this with you. Six stories up, only one fully working hand. you can see it. You can kind of tell in that shot. Not, it was clever. He uh, would wear gloves sometimes, but in this one, he's wearing a prosthetic covering. But I wanted to talk a little bit about how fast Los Angeles grew up. This is its first skyscraper in, in the city, the 12-story Brawley building, which opened in 1904 on Spring Street. And it also has those classical details. It's still there. It's a uh, locks now. It's also widely known as the Continental, which is the name that 
It changed its name several times over the years. And I want to tell you about the bank president that, uh, that, that it's named after because this started out as offices belonging to a bank. And that's John Brawley. And you see him there. He was a real California character as well. He came out from Missouri in 1847. His dad was uh, ill from malaria. And the doctor said, you've got to get out of Missouri. So they took the Oregon Trail and eventually made it to Sacramento. And their timing was immaculate because they arrived right as the gold rush was starting in 1849 in Sacramento. And so their clever, the family's clever father said, uh, let's unload these wagons and fill them up with stores from the supply location. So they, they bought flour, they bought bacon, they bought shovels and picks and overalls and everything they could throw into their, uh, their wagon that miners would want. And then they headed up into the mountains and sold them. They sold flour, uh, Brawley notes in his memoirs at a dollar a pound and were paid in gold dust. And uh, another fun event that occurred there is teenage Brawley uh, had a brand new bull calf that he named Polk after President Polk. And uh, there was a certain miner who was bragging in the mining camp about a new mule he got that was super fast. And he said, my fastest mule in the world. And a uh, fellow miner started mocking him and saying, oh, your mule couldn't even beat that kid's uh, cow. And so the miner challenged Brawley and his cow to, or his, I, I guess, calf, not cow, it was a bull, uh, his calf to a race. And Brawley took him up on it. And there was a bet of $100 or more, who's going to win? And guess what? Brawley won the race. And the other miners were so excited, hooray, they took Brawley to a, a tent in the camp where they had a daguerreotype set up. And he got his first ever daguerreotype taken right there that day. So you're looking at it. That is John Brawley right after winning the big uh, bull, bull calf versus mule prospector race in 1849. So of course he grew up, he went to college in Tennessee, came back to the family farm in California, he was a teacher, a superintendent of schools, a university official, but by the fifth, he married, uh, I should note, uh, a lovely California girl. Um, and John and Martha raised a family and then they got bored with school and they decided if they were ever gonna make some money, they had to switch careers. So in, around the age of 50, uh, they got out of schools and moved to the Central Valley and bought a raisin farm and also started up a small bank. Raisin farming was pretty tough. There were jackrabbits and then there were worms that they had to buy a bunch of turkeys to eat the worms. And I think in the end, Brawley had about a thousand turkeys that he was renting out to other farmers. Um, but anyway, that was a bit of a hassle, but the bank worked out pretty well. So he organized some more banks and eventually uh, became a, a bank official in some larger ones, moved to San Diego, and then eventually became majority owner of Southern California Savings Bank in Los Angeles. And it did so well that uh, they, the, the trustees built, uh, when they built the 12 story skyscraper, they, the board of directors rather they decided to name it after him. So it's the Brawley building. And then of course he retired. This is the picture uh, from their 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, the Brawleys became leading advocates for women's suffrage in California. John was in the Republican Party in 1911, and that year he, he, he and his wife drove through the state in his automobile supporting women's rights and, and the women's right to vote. They call him in a strangely, I guess, I guess a condescending title in a sense, but he's known as the father of California women's suffrage but it's certainly justifiable. This is a quote from Brawley. Nothing since the coming of Christ promises so much good to future humanity as the intellectual, moral, and political emancipation of women. There's no sex inequality in the kingdom of God, and there must be none in the kingdom of men. And there's this building, which is on a postcard. My book is illustrated with, uh, every building is illustrated with a souvenir postcard. And I think it nicely conveys the idea that in 1906, when this postcard is dated, uh, these old time skyscrapers were seen as marvels that you would send a, a picture of to your friends back home and say, wow, get a load of this. It says right here that it's inscribed on the postcard. This is our tallest building. Bigger ones are being built. And that's not actually quite true. Um, shortly after this building was built, 
the city decided it didn't want too many of these tall buildings blocking out the beautiful Southern California sunshine. So they passed the height limit. More than 20 years, this was the tallest building in all of Los Angeles. And its architect is another interesting story. That's John Parkinson, uh, an immigrant from England. He was a carpenter originally, he made stairs. Then he came to Seattle and he became, uh, he headed up their uh, offices that were building public schools through the city of Seattle. And then he came to California, did a bank in Napa and eventually made his way to Los Angeles where he became the most influential architect in Los Angeles in its early years. And it wasn't until 1928 that the Brawley building became the second tallest building in Los Angeles. It was passed up by LA City Hall. And it was, that was a government building, so it wasn't subject to the city's uh, height ordinances that restricted how tall buildings could be up until the 1950s. And there it is, in 1928 on its dedication, uh, the famous Los Angeles City Hall, whose architect is none other than John Parkinson. He's maybe the only architect I've read about that made the transition from building several dozens of, uh, of old-timey Beaux-Arts original skyscrapers into this Art Deco era where he, he was an architect, one of the main architects on the uh, group that did City Hall. He also designed the LA Coliseum, several of the original buildings for the University of Southern California. Um, and quite, uh, it was quite a to-do that day when they uh, unveiled the new City Hall. In fact, it wasn't just one day, it was a three-day extravaganza with this massive parade with tens of thousands of marchers and more than 100 marching bands, or more than 100 floats, I think dozens and dozens of marching bands. And the whole spectacle was produced by none other than Sid Grauman. Now, maybe you folks have heard of Sid Grauman. He is uh, a legendary Hollywood impresario. He was a theater owner, uh, most famously known for his Grauman's Chinese Theater, which you can still see on Hollywood Boulevard and which opened, you can see it there, premiere in 1927. So basically as that city hall was, was being completed. And Sid Grauman uh, pioneered things like searchlights at premieres and, and a lot of things that make Hollywood what it is today. And I actually came across some archival footage of Sid Grauman here. You can see if you watch this little clip, uh, him with the Marx Brothers and with Mae West. So let's watch that. There's Grauman's Chinese Theater. It's called there he is taking tickets. There's our star. This is from a 1933 animated uh, short, short of, uh, of Mickey Mouse for his big uh, Hollywood gala. There's one, one exception, one that isn't likely true to life of this, uh, of, of this archival footage that I found. Um, and that is that uh, Sid Grauman probably wouldn't have melted when Mae West said, come up and see me sometime. Uh, he lived alone his whole life in an apartment next to his mom. And he was widely considered to be gay, though he was not open about it. Uh, that's not to say he wasn't well acquainted with chorus girls. He knew many chorus girls because he employed them. One of them was Myrna Loy, a uh, huge star of the 1930s. Here she is with her co-star, William Powell, and with Sid Grauman at the Chinese Theater doing another thing Sid Grauman pioneered or invented, and that is putting their handprints and footprints in the concrete in front of the theater. Myrna's, if you read it, says, to Sid, who gave me my first job. And that first job was as a chorus girl at one of his movie theaters uh, before the Chinese Theater. You can see her, there's a picture of her with some other Corines. She's the one on the left. 
and it's said to be this is the this is the photo that a casting director spotted and said who is that dame there on the left I want to put her in movies so set her on the road to fame um, another thing about Grauman is that he was known as a, a wacky guy and a prankster so when the Warner Brothers opened their theater on Hollywood Boulevard he had himself delivered to the opening night gala in a hearse inside a coffin and then he burst out of it so if you look, I tell you that because if you look at Myrna Loy and William Powell, they're both wearing floppy clown shoes as a prank on Sid to their uh, uh, concrete, uh, the big footprints in the concrete moment. Of course, <laughs> they seem to have changed because you don't see floppy clown shoes in the cement. So I'll tell you Sid's background. He came from Indianapolis, but the family moved a lot. His father uh, set up a cabaret theater in the Yukon, which is the first time Sid got really involved with showbiz. But then they came back to San Francisco and opened a Nickelodeon, which was destroyed in the San Francisco earthquake. And so they put up a tent, nothing to fall down on you except canvas. But Sid always dreamed that they would build a grand movie palace instead of just these, you know, rinky dink Nickelodeon black and white films that only one person could watch, that there would be some kind of a gala and spectacle with an orchestra and a Wurlitzer organ and singers and chorus girls. And so he did. He built it in Los Angeles, the million dollar theater. You can see an advertisement for it there and some pictures of those chorus girls. It's called the million dollar for how much it costs to build. And it was built in a new skyscraper that opened in 1918 in Los Angeles. And there it is, Grauman's million dollar theater in the Edison building, uh, right in downtown Los Angeles, and it stands there today. And you can hear some of Grauman's knack for promotional language and publicity in his official statement on the opening of his first big movie theater. This is from Sid. Born of the travail of those heroic days of 1906, there came to the Graumans in the homely structure that played so noble a part in the rearing of a greater city, the splendid dream of a palace of art, a temple wherein might be enshrined the high gods of the muse and the silvered screen. This dream became a vision so gracious in its molding, so persistent in its appeal that it merged almost without realization into the material form. So today in Los Angeles stands Brownman's. And this big movie palace had 2,400 seats and each of them had a special electrical switch so that when you sat down, it activated a console uh, that the ushers could see. So they were always aware of who was sitting or what seats were still occupied so they could pack the place. And they did every night. It was full to capacity. Um, you can see the marquee there in front. Maybe you recognize Harold Lloyd doing yet another one of his skyscraper films. This one is billed as high and dizzy. And above that, you can see the name of the place, the Edison Building. Uh, this, it's not the million dollar theater building, the theater is on the lower floors, but the, uh, the Edison building is the skyscraper and it was offices for the power company, California Edison plus the headquarters of the water company that also helped generate that power. And you can see that on the back of the skyscraper. This is my photos from a visit. Well, uh, actually just last month the Metropolitan Water District. In fact, that top floor was the office and boardroom of William Mulholland himself, of Mulholland Drive, of course, the man who engineered the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which was uh, said at the time to be a project on the scale of the Panama Canal, 233 miles long, which basically made the expansion and growth of Los Angeles possible by supplying water and then power. And uh, right there is the still original uh, top floor doorways of the of the boardroom and and of uh, William Mulholland's offices. Now, though, this building is all residential, and so that was formerly the penthouse of none other than Nicholas Cage. He's now moved to another location in Los Angeles, another old building, I'm told. But uh, Nicholas Cage's old penthouse. I don't know which one is a, a more amazing former occupant, Mulholland or Cage. You'll have to decide. There's that marquee outside still today. The style of architecture, uh, that facade, is a very fascinating one that you encounter mostly in Southern California called California Churrigueresque. Churrigueresque. So it's an extreme form of Spanish Baroque 
uh, <clears throat> and it's so over the top, you can see it's, it's perfect for Hollywood. Um, it was a very high fashion style of facade at the time. It was new to me when I first found out about this building. I'd never seen anything like it. It just blows me away. You can see those buffaloes and there's a Egyptian ibis headed God up there and there's you know, people capering left and right and, and so forth. And boy, if you, uh, if you go inside, you'll see even more. I'll show you in a second. But it apparently reached its zenith of popularity right around the 1915 Panama uh, Pacific Expositions. Well, there were two competing World's Fair Expositions. One was in San Francisco and then another opened in San Diego. Maybe I'll talk to you a little bit about that next week. But you can still see this Churigaresque style of architecture in Southern California and Balboa Park for sure in San Diego, the site of that expo, but also uh, the Beverly Hills uh, City Hall and, and lots of old Southern California buildings. And as I say, you go inside still occasionally used for film festivals and on weekends for church services. So this is something I took during my tour there last month with the property manager. And she told us that the whole complex, uh, it includes Grand Central Market, by the way, which is a lot of fun next door, but that the, the owner wants to do a whole renovation, particularly of the theater, and that that will cost something on the order of $20 million. Now, if you look over that proscenium, that is a, a sort of Mayan, almost, uh, representation of the god of the west wind. So this comes from a popular fairy tale at the time. So this was, as I said before, Grauman's first big theater, before he did the Egyptian theater and the Chinese theater. And the walls were absolutely covered with murals. And one architectural magazine that I read described the use of color as being almost to a barbaric degree. So some of those murals are lost now. There's been some rain damage as you can see in the photo, but the carved organ screen, which you can see in the image to the left, which flanks the uh, stage on both sides is absolutely a sight to behold. And you can tell that it's a glorious space. And hopefully it, like many of the buildings that I've visited and seen and shown you today is due for renovation anytime. So if you're ever in Los Angeles when they're showing a film there, I highly recommend you visit the Million Dollar Theater, Sid Grauman's first movie palace.